Uh, thanks again to everybody for, for logging in today. I understand it's a Friday morning, it's uh, summertime. Most of you would probably rather be out on a roof or a job site getting some product installed and making some money. Although, um, you know, <laughs> if your weather's anything like what we're having here in Sacramento where we're gonna hit probably 110 today, maybe you're happy to be inside and uh, sitting on your computer and tuning in. In any event, thanks for coming. So, uh, you know, before we get to the really fun part of, of talking through some products and seeing, um, you know, what's new and, and what's exciting in the market, um, just kind of wanted to take a minute and talk about, generally speaking, what drives new products. Uh, in our market, it's, it's a couple things, really. It's compliance, so um, new products that come out to meet a new code or um, tariff or, or some other kind of government or, or jurisdictional requirement. Um, time savings, so getting you in and out of the job uh, quicker. Um, cost savings, either directly through the item itself or the elimination of an accessory or other component. And then finally, yield improvements. So in, in solar, this can be a couple things. This can be um, you know, improving the, the hours of the day that the system operates, improving the efficiency, improving the wattage. It can be a number of things. So you know, those are all factors that lead to manufacturers launching new products and really us taking them on. Uh, there's a lot of things that come across my desk every day, um, new products, exciting new widgets, and you know those are the four things that I look at to determine if it's something we're going to add. Um, yeah, of course, customers asking for them directly uh, is is also very important. So uh, I would encourage you to uh, to reach out to, to to me, to your salesperson, to my team. Anytime you you hear of something new that you think we should be carrying, um, well, odds are we're already working on it, but um, you know, we encourage you to provide that feedback to us regardless. Um, the things that we'll be talking about today in terms of new products, um, inverters, um, microinverters and optimizers, um, you know, generally speaking, power conversion, um, talking about storage products, uh, specifically batteries, and we'll be talking about a few modules as well. Um, in, in putting this webinar together, you know, I looked through everything, everything that we'd added over the past three months, products that we're looking at for Q3, and um, obviously had a lot more than 60 minutes of content. So I tried to distill this down to what I thought would be the most impactful for you guys. Um, obviously, there's a lot more here than a lot more in our portfolio and our catalog that we can speak to today. Um, so I you know, encourage you guys to reach out with any questions. Do take advantage of that survey that Hannah mentioned. It's, it's, uh, it's great feedback for us and uh, you know, helps us drive the right kind of content to help you guys do your jobs better. So encourage you to, to check that out and, and give us some good, candid, frank feedback. So that said, let's start talking brass tacks. Um, we're going to be leading off today with the LG Chem uh, storage offer. So this is the Resu and Resu H product lines. Um, Resu are the 48-volt the um, lithium-ion battery packs you see on the top row. Um, and there's a 6.5 kilowatt hour. There's a 10 kilowatt hour. There's also a 3.3. Um, we're, we're not planning on stocking that now just because the, you know, the sizing is pretty small. Um, we feel like most of our customers who are going to be using this product are going to need a little bit bigger you know, energy footprint. And while you, can, um, while you can parallel these batteries with their Resu Plus um, accessory, we just didn't really see a need for a 3.3 in the portfolio. That said, if it's something that you guys really feel strongly about, we're happy to bring it in and support you. Um, these are going to be shipping uh, Q3, where we're awaiting kind of final certification and, and firmware um, regression testing from LG Chem. But right out of the gate, these would be compatible with the Schneider Electric XW Plus line of inverter chargers. Um, these are applications that will support um, a pure off-grid, it will support uh, battery backup, support all the self-consumption um, architectures and applications that are out there. Um, and there will be some, some further inverter capability coming down the road in, in Q3, Q4. Um, nothing I'm allowed to speak to right now, but you know, safe to say it's stuff we're excited about. The, uh, the bulk of what we'll be talking about today with, Res with LG Chem Resu lineup is the H, H4 higher voltage. Um, so we've got a Resu 10H here in the US. There's a, there's a 7H product that's available internationally, but um, you know, here in the US, we've got big homes and big loads, and, um, generally speaking, the, the 10 is a much better fit. So we've got these in stock now. Um, they're storage compatible. 
Um, so that's the Solar Edge Store Edge product, and we'll talk about that in a few slides. Um, as of uh, as of just a few weeks ago, they are two to one compatible. Um, so we don't yet have the secondary batteries into stock, but we have them on order. Two to one compatible meaning you can run a primary and a secondary, or a, a master and a slave configuration onto each um, Solar Edge storage inverter. So very exciting, you know really opens up the market in places like Hawaii and San Diego and some of the other areas where, um, you know, it's got much greater uh, evening loads, much greater self-consumption needs, and uh, we're really excited about that. So before I can really get into too many details on the on the Resu, Resu 10H lineup, I, I thought it'd be helpful to just kind of revisit the, the rationale or the, um, you know, kind of the business case, if you will, behind lithium ion. So, ion and I'll speak specifically about the nickel manganese cobalt chemistry because there's um, one thing to always remember with lithium ion is there's you know, I think a dozen you know viable lithium ion chemistries out there and it's um, um, it, it's good to have an apples to apples comparison or at least you know generally speaking um, to confirm which one you're talking about so nickel manganese cobalt really excels in, in three areas I think where um, Lead acid, you know, flooded or AGM has not. First of which is energy density. So um, the, the available kilowatt hours per, you know, per gallon of volume or per kilogram of weight is just slightly, you know, much better with, uh, with lithium ion. Part of that has to do with the depth of discharge, but part of that is just the, the chemical properties and how much, uh, how much energy can be extracted out of the same amount of material. Um, the second, you know, capability here is, is charge and discharge capability, and um, I am not a scientist. I'm not an engineer, so I'm going to I'm going to try to explain this in the you know the the layperson terms that it was explained to me and that I um, studied the the topic. Um, the the charge discharge capability of lithium ion is is much better than lead acid at a couple different parameters. So you see here on the right, um, I've got a couple different um, graphics. On the top, you'll see charge discharge curves for a, a you know, quote unquote typical um, lead acid arrangement. And you see the different, the different curves here represent different um, basically charge discharge, excuse me, different discharge currents. Um, so at a, at all the way on the left, 5C, basically you're, you're just trying, you know, if, a, if you're talking about a 100 amp hour battery, you're discharging the battery at, um, at five times its rated um, its rated energy, um, you see there at, at at five and at three C, you're getting less than twenty percent of the actual energy out of the battery. Um, maybe an easier way to think about this is the is the graphic on the left, where we're lo where we're looking at usable energy in, in a lead acid battery. So on the left, on the far left, in the top corner here, um, you see a, a, a sample battery. And at, at 0.05 C or a 20 hour rate, you're able to get something like, you know, 100% um, of the usable energy drawn out of the battery. Um, as you start to discharge that battery more aggressively in terms of higher currents and, you know, the inverse of that being the, the hour rate, um, you get less and less usable energy. Part of that is just because that energy turns into heat in a battery. If you've ever, you know, discharged a battery really aggressively, uh, you can tell physically it heats up. Um, you know, we know through through chemistry and physics that um, energy that's created to heat is not available for other sources. Um, suffice it to say, better usable energy out of lithium-ion batteries um, if you discharge them aggressively than you would uh, similarly in a lead-acid battery. Last thing on here is, is partial state of charge. Um, we've had some great advances the last couple of years um, with lead acid batteries and lead acid battery manufacturers using carbon in their in their chemistries to help offset the prevalence of sulfation. Um, sulfation occurs when you um, when you run a battery at partial state of charge and and never take it through a full charge not never but don't take it through a full charge cycle um, as regularly as you would if it were being used in a in an off grid or a, um, a backup scenario. Um, lead acid or lithium ion batteries are, are uh, much more tolerant of this type of usage. 
Um, they can be left at partial state of charge. They can be, you know, discharged down to 40% capacity and only taken up to 75 or 80. And they just don't seem to mind as much. Um, so for the self the self consumption applications that we're looking at these days, um, much better fit using that chemistry. Um, so all of these are reasons why lithium ion may be a better chemistry for your application. Um, now we'll talk a little bit about why the LG Chem lineup, why why that lithium ion chemistry. Um, so these are all things that we looked at in making the decision to bring this battery into our portfolio. Um, we recognize that in in this part of the market, that aesthetics can be important. So it's a light, it's a compact design. It's um, the high voltage model has a real, um, a real short depth. So if you are mounting it in a garage, it's not going to be obtrusive. Um, it's wall mount, so you're saving the floor space for, you know, if you're like me, you've got car strollers and golf clubs and things that occupy floor space. You can mount this inverter, you know, up off the floor and save some of that footprint. Um, it is NEMA 3R approved. We do we do support outdoor installation. Um, there's a big asterisk there, and that's around, you know, temperature. Um, you know, I mentioned at the beginning here, we're going to hit 110 in Sacramento. Um, me, personally, I'm not looking forward to installing it outside. Um, I'm going to, uh, down the road, put mine in my garage. Um, but that's really up to you. You know, it is NEMA 3R rated. If you do have a, a gentle climate, uh, you can save yourself even more floor space, even more wall space in that garage or utility closet and, uh, and mount it outside. Maximum power of five kilowatts, um, so 10, or excuse me, 9.8 kilowatt hours, um, a five kilowatt draw, um, so real, um, real good um, energy and power production. Um, the, um, the high efficiency helps the, the product heat dissipation, and of course, you know, all of the certification, all of the quality that you would come to expect out of a company like LG. Um, really, as we as we put this unit through its paces. Uh, we were really satisfied with, with what we saw. So what will you need? Uh, here on the left, I've, uh, I've included a, um, a snapshot from the, uh, from the SolarEdge um, self-consumption application guide from the StoreEdge product line. This is a kind of a fully blown out um, self-consumption with backup application. So you see here, um, you know, you're going to need modules. So call AE Solar will take care of you. You'll need racking, of course. I won't belabor that point. Um, the big fundamentals that you're going to need, you're going to need a storage inverter. Uh, you're going to need um, the equivalent amount of optimizers. You're going to need uh, an LG Chem or possibly two battery packs. Those are the key components you'll need for any LG Chem storage installation. Um, if you just have a self-consumption application where um, you want to charge that battery up during the day and you want to offset loads um, during the evening, that'll get you there. Um, if, like most folks in, in North America, you're also interested in backup capability, you want to be able to, you know, run your system and power critical loads when, uh, when the grid goes down or you want to be able to, you know, island those loads, um, you'll need a couple additional things. You'll need this, um, this storage electricity meter. Um, along with that, you'll need the, the equivalent CTs, um, 200 amp or 400 amp, depending on your service. Um, you'll also need this auto former, which uh, is going to be needed to support single phase loads uh, for backup. Um, great advantage of using the, the SolarEdge product is the cloud-based monitoring is included. Um, you will need the, we recommend using the, the GSM cellular uh, monitoring. That way you're not relying on the homeowner's uh, Wi-Fi or LAN network. Um, really just a simplified experience. I will point out here, and I don't have it mentioned, that the um, Storage inverters are also available with um, revenue grade metering built in. So if you're in areas or you're using a financing package like Sunruns that require a, um, a revenue grade uh, production meter, um, you can now do that inside the inverter. No need to wire up the meter socket, the meter. Um, no need to deal with all of that extra work and cost. You can get it that latent in the meter and, excuse me, latent in the inverter and, you know, if you're like us, it's a big, uh, big time and, and labor savings. So I've got here all of the all of the items and the descriptions and the list prices of, of what you'd need for a full um, LG Chem storage backup application. And we will keep moving along. Um, I, I, I put in here a list 
of, um, of resources and um, certification things that you'll need to be um, an above board and approved and compliant LG Chem installer. Um, the first thing here is um, some guidelines from the Department of Transportation and Hazmat Safety Administration on how to develop a hazmat training program. Um, lithium ion is considered hazmat, so um, you know if you don't have a program like this set up for your employees for dealing with um, with hazmat products, you'll, you'll likely want to do that. Um, additionally, um, lithium ion batteries are are governed and regulated by DOT and IATA, IATA for air shipments and DOT for ground shipments. Um, you will need a, a certification from those two entities. There is here, two links for these certification programs. Um, LG Chem has done the, the legwork on this and they've negotiated a, a discount for these uh, certification programs. So if you click on those links and enter that code right there and hit recalculate, um, you'll get a discount on them. In addition to that, there's one more, uh, there's one more checkbox you'll need to tick off with LG Chem and that's their certification test. So that link takes you to a, a survey which is essentially a um, you know, certification test. It's, I think, 20 questions. I went through it in about 15 minutes. Um, if you've taken a look at the manual and you've done your, your due diligence that you should with any new product that you're thinking about bringing on board, uh, you'll find it really straightforward and uh, you shouldn't have any issues. I know in the past we've had um, um, other lithium ion manufacturers with, with pretty, uh, pretty rigorous and onerous certification requirements and this is this is nothing like that. This is um, this is kind of the the essentials to make sure that you're going to install the product in a safe way. Um, but it is not a graduate level class in chemistry. Uh, it's not an engineering program. Um, it's you know LG Chem recognizes that um, they need to make sure you're going to do the job the right way, but that um, you don't have hours and hours to spend on the certification for for buying their product. Uh, additionally, a last, last couple things I'll include here, um, link to the installation manual, um, skip down here, the product specification sheet, the UL certification that you'll need on hand, the MSDS, the data, the, the safety data sheet uh, you'll want to keep in your, um, in your warehouse or shop, and then lastly, some information on the installation handles. So um, the product is very heavy. It's, uh, the, the Resu 10H is about 220 pounds. Got a sleek aluminum exterior that looks great when it's mounted on the wall, but it really doesn't present anywhere to grab the battery and pick it up and hang it. So we do recommend a, buying a set of the installation handles. Um, you'll only need one set of handles per crew that's going to be dealing with it. Um, really makes it a lot easier to get it, you know, get it picked up and hung on the wall. Um, you know, obviously you're going to avoid damaging the product. You're going to avoid, you know, guys throwing their backs out. Uh, highly recommended. So that's it for the LG Chem Resi 10H, and we'll keep moving along. Uh, next product up that I wanted to talk to you guys about today is the uh, Solar Edge HD Wave lineup. And if you're like me, you've been paying attention to this. You know that the 3000 and the 3800 have been out on the market, uh, you know, since Q4. Um, we've been eagerly awaiting the next um, next power classes, and they're here. Um, I'll talk about that in a few slides on the particulars, but generally speaking, what they've done with this new HD Wave lineup is they've reduced the, the, the components in there, um, they've streamlined it, they've made it a lot more efficient, and they've taken a lot of the weight and volume out of it. So you see here a side-by-side -side comparison of the 7600 models. 12.2 um, gallons, that's the, you know, the volumetric um, measurement, versus 5.9, so basically half the volume. Um, and they've taken out more than half the weight, and they've made it more efficient. Um, it's really, I'd say it's almost alarming when you see them, um, you know, boxed up. I pulled one off the shelf in our warehouse a few weeks ago, and I had to do a double take. I thought I had a box of optimizers. That's how small it is boxed up. Um, it's, uh, you know, presents a great opportunity to um, save, save space, save weight, make for an easier installation. I mean, this is no longer a two-man project to get these hung on the wall. So, so very excited there. Um, so the benefits, we'll talk about efficiency, 99% CEC weighted. So that's an improvement over, um, over the last, last generation as well as uh, other manufacturers out in the field. 
Um, they're now designing exclusively with thin film capacitors rather than electrolytic. The drawback with electrolytic capacitors in the past was um, they've got a, a, they're, they're liquid filled, and eventually, over time, through power cycling, through heat, those will dry up, and the you know the capacitor will eventually fail. Um, much longer lifespan, much more durable now with those thin film capacitors. We talked about small and lightweight. Um, they've increased the DC to AC oversizing. So this is something, you know, over paneling is nothing new in the market. Um, we're really pushing the edge here with how much we can over panel DC to AC um, up to 155% uh, with multiple MPPT channels. Um, of course, that's nothing new either. You can orient, you know, east, west, south on, uh, on multiple strings there. Um, and really now you can oversize to get the maximum amount of production out of a given roof. Um, so exciting there that that threshold keeps creeping up. Longer strings. If you've attended any of those Solar Edge trainings in the past, you've probably memorized 5,250. 52 because there's 52 uh, cards in a deck or 52 weeks in a year and 50 states in the union. Well, now you're going to have to memorize something else, 5,700 watts per string. So, um, you know, in addition to higher efficiency, higher oversizing, now you've got longer strings, just, you know, more flexibility in, um, in how we're wiring these things. Of course, integrated auto rapid shutdown, um, that's been a solar edge benefit for some time now. One other thing I'll call out here, and I'd encourage you to, to check this out with solar edge themselves, is the capability of doing, uh, um, you know, essentially remote commissioning. So you can um, install the unit, run it through um, a, a startup cycle and commissioning, and when you finally get that permission to operate from uh, from your AHJ, from your inspector, you can do it remotely through the Solar Edge app. You no longer have to roll a truck and you know manually go out to the unit and flip the switch. You can do it remotely. You don't have to ask the home to do that anymore either. Um, nice little feature where Solar Edge really kind of paid attention to what was going on in the market and things that would help save installers time and money. So. Great feature. I uh, would encourage you to check that out in more detail with Solar Edge, um, or ask any of the folks at AE Solar. We're happy to tell you more about it. Uh, benefits continued. Smaller packaging. You know, it's going to take up less space on in a truck. It's going to take up less space in your um, in your shop. It's going to be cheaper to ship out to you. One person installation. Mentioned that before. Um, they've simplified the uh, the front panel there. Fewer buttons now. Faster commissioning, and um, Built-in meter, I'll mention this for a second here. We talked about this a few slides ago around revenue-grade metering. Um, great feature there. Um, great time savings, again, if you're dealing with anyone, finance or, or HJs, et cetera, that require a separate revenue-grade meter. Um, so brass tax here. Now shipping, we've got the 3,000, the 3,800. The um, we will have the 5,000 H in stock in just a few weeks. And the 6,000H will be coming in July. So really close to having that full lineup um, of HD wave inverters. Of course, we've still got the um, a limited supply of the classic inverters. So if you do have a job where it was really hard spec and you don't want to do a change order, uh, let us know. We could probably find one or two for you. Uh, next, I want to talk about the SMA Power Plus lineup. So. Um, this is the product line that we had been eagerly awaiting and launched in uh, early Q2. So it's a combination of uh, latest generation of Sunny Boy string inverters paired with a uh, module level power electronic technology. So it helps you meet 2017 NDC, helps you mitigate shading, helps with multiple orientations. And what's, what's really interesting and exciting about this product is you can deploy it in a couple ways. So here we're looking at a, a Power Plus full deployment um, where we've got um, optimization um, on each of these uh, TS4 uh, microinverters, or excuse me, optimizers. So um, basically what you're getting with each of these optimizers is of course rapid shutdown, but they're all optimizing uh, their individual modules uniquely. Um, then of course, you know, Sunny Boy, you will need a wireless uh, communication product, and we'll talk about that in a slide, but you know, basically the full, um, the full inverter plus optimization architecture that you're probably familiar with from other brands. So again, what you'll need for that, um, TS4 devices, one per module, um, Sunny Boy inverter, and the rooftop communication kit. Um, you know, I mentioned that 
this is a really interesting product because there's a couple different ways and a couple different products to use in terms of optimization. So um, you can go the full optimization route, which is the uh, TS4-R-O. So this includes optimization, um, compensates for signs of aging on the module. Um, if the module is shaded, it'll go into bypass mode and it won't have any impact on the other modules in that string. Um, and then of course, if you don't need optimization on that string, on that particular module, you know that you're going to have shade full day. Um, you're not worried about shading or you know, any other effects. You can just run the um, the TS4-R-S, which is the shutdown modules. So you can have module level deactivation, um, fully compliant with NEC 2014. And what's interesting is you can mix and match. So we call this uh, selective deployment. So in this instance, we've got a string of six modules, five of which have the um, TS4-R-S shutdown optimizers, and only one of which that has the optimization um, optimizer, excuse me. So if you did have shading from this tree and it was only on this, this leftmost module, um, you could um, more effectively and more efficiently and um, you know, cost-wise save a bit of money by only putting the optimization where it's absolutely needed. Um, so the advantages here, you know, additional energy gains, a simplified design process, uh, more flexibility, and of course the, the things that you gain um, from a selective deployment, more cost effective than using optimization on every module, um, streamlined logistics, a faster installation, and reduced reduce service risk. So um, a product that we're excited about, we've seen some, some good returns already, if you're, uh, if you're a loyal SMA customer, or even if you haven't used them in quite some time, I'd encourage you to, to check it out. Outback Power Grid Support Products. So I mentioned at the beginning that one of the drivers of new product development and innovation is, is code compliance. And this is one of those areas. So um, what, are you, what are they? What are we talking about? We're talking about the FXR and Radian product lines. Um, so those are the inverter chargers that you've known and loved for, for quite some time now. Um, additionally, in the, in the lineup is the Mate 3S, which includes some new, um, some new firmware and communication capabilities needed for, for getting all of these um, features and benefits out of the inverters themselves. How are they different? Well, if, you've, uh, if you're in California or Hawaii or you're a, you know, a code wonk like I can be at some time, um, you've probably heard about UL 1741 Supplement A. So that is the test standard that certifies an inverter is capable of meeting um, HECO Rule 14H or California Rule 21. What is that? Well, essentially, this, these, are, um, these are communication and interconnection standards for inverters to operate in a quote-unquote smart grid environment. So um, previously, UL 1741, based on IEEE 1547 had some pretty strict anti-islanding requirements. If the um, if the grid source went above or below a fixed uh, frequency or voltage, the inverter had to shut down. Um, it then had to um, wait until the grid was qualified. Once the grid was qualified, there would be a 300 second um, startup window before the inverter could then begin exporting current. Um, some of that has changed, and some of that hasn't changed in um, 1741 Supplement A. So essentially, um, utilities have figured out that if an inverter can, can ride through a low or high voltage scenario, if it can ride through a low or high frequency scenario, um, that's much easier for the grid to tolerate than you know, five to seven to 10 kilowatts of solar per home shutting on and shutting off, um, really presenting um, a lot of um, a lot of impact or a lot of you know brute force to the grid. So um, utilities have collaborated with with UL to create this advanced supplement A standard that provides for the following: um, you know, continued anti-islanding protection, but low and high frequency ride through, low and high voltage ride through, um, bold and var mode, a specified power factor, um, ramp things like normal ramp rates and soft start ramp rates. Um, optional frequency watt and volt watt responses, and then in HECO, um, remote connect and disconnect. So these are all smart inverter functions that um, that will start to be required September 8th in Hawaii and California. 
and that we anticipate by 2019 will be kind of standard throughout the U.S. Um, Outback, you know, recognizing how uh, how many of their products and how many of the installers are installing these products in grid interactive scenarios, really wanted to be you know at the forefront of making sure that um, grid support or smart or smart inverter functions were supported. So what will you need? Well, um, they made it pretty easy. It's the same inverter and um, FP flex power models. Um, they'll have an A suffix, so same form factor, same aesthetic, same spare parts. Um, there have been a few hardware changes, but they've minimized this uh, as much as possible. Um, there's, of course, new firmware. You will need a Mate 3S for grid support inverters. So there's some communication capability that's needed in that Mate 3S. Um, if you're replacing an inverter in an older system, you will have to update all those inverters with new firmware via the Mate 3S. So if you've got, a, for example, a, an FP3, a, um, a FlexPower 3, uh, system with three um, FX inverters and you need to replace one of them or you want to add on one of them, you'll of course need the new um, FXR inverter um, and eight 3S to be able to upload the new firmware um, and then you'll go through the, the commissioning as you would. So the timeline, uh, we anticipate having these in stock for the Radian products. Um, so the, the individual Radians as well as the FPR products, we're going to have these in stock late August. So you'll have, you know, three, four weeks to make sure you get them into your supply and installed before that hard September 8th day date in California and Hawaii. And for the FXR products, uh, we're anticipating having those in stock late September. All right. Um, continued. You know, I did talk a little bit about um, aesthetics in, um, in, in why new products are brought to market, and the array skirt is a, is a great example of that. So this is a new product from Snap and Rack that creates a, a really aesthetically pleasing finish to any system installation. So this is a uh, this is a this is a product that installs here on the bottom the bottom edge um, of an array and just kind of helps to helps to hide the uh, you know the the racking the standoffs the L feet um, from the underside of the module. If you know if like my home you know you're you're looking up at the roof. And from your front door, the first thing you see is the underside of the module and the rail. Um, the skirt there have, helps to um, helps to mask that a little bit, creates a more pleasing aesthetic for um, for homeowners, for neighbors. So um, available for customers that request skirts as a finishing touch. Installs to the module independent of the racking system. So um, great retrofit capability. You know, if for some reason you installed something other than snap and rack back in the day. You can go back to some of those and, and retrofit with the skirt series. Um, so the install process is, is really straightforward. Uh, the skirt mounts um, from hooks onto the inside of the module frame and is tightened just using one one bolt here on the uh, on the leading edge. Multiple mounts must be secured um, prior to the skirt attachment. So you're going to want to go on and you know mount on those uh, those hooks to the leading edge of the of the modules. And then the skirt snaps easily down onto the frame. So we've got here a table of the, the different rail spans and the, the skirt mount spans that we recommend. Um, the skirt comes in uh, standard length sections, so 162 inch to match the standard rail length. Um, the skirt mounts themselves are pre-assembled, so these are these, these brackets here we talked about and uh, attached to any standard module using a single bolt with a half inch socket. Uh, the splice itself snaps into the skirt, so um, keeps those aligned, keeps it uh, nice and tight. And then rubber end caps snap into the ends for a nice clean finish. So great looking product, it's really a nice finishing touch to any, um, to any system you're working on. You know, we know that with, with black on black modules and uh, even black on white, the module manufacturers have gone a long way in improving the aesthetics you know, from the days of those bright blue poly disco ball modules we've had. And now the rest of the system is is kind of up to par with that. So great product that, that we're excited about. I've got here the, the part numbers you'd need. So the skirt set themselves, um, box of six, 162 inch. Uh, you'll need the frame mounts, the skirt splice, the end cap pair, um, and then the individual um, skirts. Um, as always, you know, feel free to reach out to your TSA, your TSM, 
um, or anyone on my team with any questions on this product. And moving along, talked about aesthetics. Um, this is a module where we, it was, it was quite a long time in development and we're really excited that it's here. This is the REC 280 TP Black 2. Um, so this is the, the next generation in the, um, in the Twin Peaks series from REC. It has a black back sheet and new cell processing, processing uh, to create an all black module. So you see here, I mean, this looks, this looks like a spectacular black on black, black on black, all black module. Um, so the newest version includes uh, black cross connectors and black inverted serial number and barcode. Uh, available in what what class is similar to the standard Twin Peak. You know, I will say that you know, like any other Bob or Black on Black product, you do experience a, a slightly lower wattage class. Um, simply having the black back sheet is going to um, is going to reduce uh, by a little bit the amount of kind of re refraction that you get off that whack, that white black sheet. So we've got the T80, excuse me, the 280 TP Black Two. Um, this is essentially the Black on Black version of the 290 TP Two that we have. Um, so in wattage class is similar, but but not exactly lined up to the standard Twin Peak modules. Um, for those of you that haven't used these REC products before, you're probably wondering what is a Twin Peak module. Um, simply put, it's it's half cut cells, so it reduces the series resistance and improves the shading performance. Um, essentially, here on the left, you've got a wiring diagram, and um, the cells are cut in half. They're strung um, basically in parallel. You see the two. The two strings here that are then you know paralleled back together again. So it does have a split junction box. If you look at the back of this module, there's essentially two junction boxes on either side of the equator of the module. Effectively, um, if you can see my cursor here and here, um, reduces the heat accumulation. Um, I will say it does does take a little getting used to of the um, the wiring. So you'll want to walk through this with your teams. Just to point out that um, they'll want to train the wires a slightly different way. Um, takes about five minutes to familiarize yourself with the layout and you know remind yourself of, of how to train the wire in the rail once you get it on the roof. Um, but the benefits are there. Uh, produces more output at higher temperature, captures more light, um, and then you get all of the typical benefits you would see with an REC group module. Um, high quality, 100% PID free, uh, minimum LID loss, and uh, one of the best temperature coefficients in the industry. So this is a product we're really bullish on. We think it's going to do great things. Um, I think the best, um, the best thing about the TP modules is the improvement performance in shaded conditions. So because the strings are run in parallel, you know, north and south, if you will, um, if you do orient these in, uh, in portrait mode and you have some shading on the lower or the, I suppose in theory, the higher edge, um, you'll have much better performance than you would a typically strong module. So um, great benefit there to the TP series. And um, you know, again, we're, we're, we're excited about where this module is going. Um, well, I, I got through that in, in enough time to allow some time for questions. Um, Hannah, have we had any questions come in from the field? Uh, yeah, we got a couple of really good ones here. Um, All right. So I'll go ahead and kick off our Q&A session. Um, so just a reminder, if you do have any questions, anyone, um, you can submit those through that questions box on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, should be in that control panel, and we'll get through as many as time allows. All right. Um, so our first question, Josh, is about um, the LG Chem Resu 10. Um, I don't know if mm -hmm. you want to go back to those slides, but i um, wondering if you could talk about cycle life and DOD. Yeah. So the... Um let me go back to that. I didn't have anything specifically um, prepared there, but um, let me get back to it. Apologies. Um, if you um, if you go to the warranty statement on these batteries, they're guaranteed for, um, um, if I recall my numbers properly, they're guaranteed for 60% um, usable energy, so 60% of rated nameplate capacity um, at 10 years, with I believe. Um, 3,000 cycles. Um, that's one I want to check on. So if you, um, when you fill out that survey, if you leave your name and email address, I will follow up with you on that. Um, 
but obviously that's a question that comes up whenever whenever people are talking about batteries and specifically lithium ion. Um, what does the warranty call for? What's the cycle life? What's the depth of discharge? Um, so that's the question on, on cycle life and warranty. Um, the depth of the discharge, um, again, I think there's, there's, there's what's in the manual and what's recommended and then there's, you know, kind of what's practical or, you know, maybe what's, what's common sense. Um, not having the manual in front of me, um, I probably wouldn't be comfortable cycling this down to lower than 20% regularly. Um, that's a question you'll, you'll probably want to, you know, investigate on your own. Um, this is a very high performance battery and, you know, unlike lead acid chemistry where they really didn't recommend more than 50%, 50 percent depth of discharge, you can take these down to a much lower percentage. Um, hopefully that, that answers your question. All right. Um, our next questions are about uh, the solar edge uh, storage. Um, mm -hmm. So the first question is, does SGIP require RGM option in the storage? Um, not that I'm aware of, not the SGIP program. Um, you could have some you could have some different requirements from your local IOU, your investor owned utility. Um, I'm not hundred percent up to speed on those, so you'll you'll want to check that out. Um, but as as far as I know, it's not a requirement for SGIP. Um, there okay. may be some requirements around generation metering, but it's not specifically required uh, in the inverter itself. All right, um, and a follow-up question to that. Does the storage without the RGM option do smart energy management functions? Yes, it will. Um, again, you'll, you'll need the meter and the CTs to be able to do that. Um, you know, RGM is there to be able to provide revenue grade metering to your financing company or your utility or your AHJ, um, but it's not specifically needed for the smart energy function. All right. Um, and the next question we have is about the HD wave inverter. I'm wondering about the warranties on those inverters. So same, same warranties that you have in the classics, which um, I believe are 12 years. All right. Um, the next question we have is on the array skirt. All right. And I'll wondering if questions. the array, yeah. Um, so wondering if those array get... skirts cause, oh yeah, we'll get there. All right, uh, the question is, does the array skirt cause higher temperature and lower power? Um, that's a great question. And I'm sure in, in some instances it would. Um, you are restricting the airflow kind of through the south end of the module. Um, you know, if uh, you, you're, you you still allow air to flow kind of east-west uh, on the underside of the module, but you are restricting the airflow. I'm, I'm sure there is some, um, however small, effect to the, uh, you know, the under module temperature. Um, as far as I know, we haven't run any testing or snap and rack hasn't on you know, side-by-side -side comparisons and, and roof temperatures, um, but that is something you would have to consider, yeah. All right. Great question. Um, yeah, and the next question we have is on the REC 280s. Okay. All right. Uh, do you have any estimates of first-year LID loss on the REC 280s? Um, I don't. That's probably something we can track down from, um, from our supplier, though. Um, okay. Yeah, you know the, the the materials I got and that I researched showed that it was minimal. You know that's um, that's a very broad statement. Um, <laughs> it's something we would have to benchmark against. You know, a similar black on black product. Um, great questions. Okay, and going back to some of the other products we talked about, um, can the LG Chem work with other inverter manufacturers? Um, right now, no. I know that LG Chem is working on some compatibility with some other products we'll see likely in Q4. Um, but in terms of uh, inverters that available, are available now or within the next you know, month or two, um, the storage is the only option. Okay. For the, let me, let me put that out there, for the Resu 10H. Um, for the 48 volt 
options. Um, Schneider Electric Connect XW Plus is the only inverter charger on the market right now that um, will be compatible when we get those batteries. Uh, they're looking at other compatibility with other inverter charger manufacturers, but that's the only one at this time. Okay. Um, and if you have two of the LG um, packs on the same system, do you need the LG coupler or can the storage handle both batteries? Uh, there's no coupler needed on the uh, Resi 10H. Um, the storage will handle both batteries. All right. Um, and then a question, will the storage benefit from the HD Wave technology? Um, that's on their roadmap for, um, I don't want to get in trouble with Solar Edge, for 2018, I believe, um, but not, not for this year, no. All right. Well, it looks like it's wrapping up the questions we've gotten so far. If anyone does have any further questions, feel free to send them over or um, feel free to email them over to, to Josh. There's his email um, or to your AE sales rep, and they can easily pass you along if, um, if they don't know the answer themselves. Um, and just a reminder, everyone, to submit your questions to that survey um, when you exit the webinar, and we'll send you a copy of this presentation. All right, thanks so much, Josh. Hey, thank you. Thanks to the audience for, for coming out, and um, have a great weekend. Hope to hear from you. And um, yeah, thanks for your business. Great, and um, everyone join us next month. The July 28th will be our next AE Solar webinar, and the topic will be Commercial Systems 101. Um, so that'll be another a good one if you're looking to branch out into commercial jobs. Um, should be a good um, hour-long webinar for you. And don't forget to check out our website at aeesolar.com for more training opportunities through us. Uh, we have workshops coming up. We have more webinars on the schedule, um, ways, to, ways to do additional training and your up to, um, continuing education credits. So, all right. Well, thanks again, everyone, for attending, and, and have a great weekend. Thanks for doing business with AE Solar. <laughs>